If you want to recall drums in any sensible modern way, you're going to need a bunch of mic pre's. And in my opinion, the minimum channel count that you need for drums to record a basic three-piece kit like I play is nine mics. Now, I just play with kick, snare, floor tom, two crashes, and a hi-hat. I keep it basic because my skills as a drummer are also basic. But most drummers are going to play with a five-piece kit and a ride cymbal and a whole bunch of other stuff to hit. In which case, you're going to need two more tom mics at least, and many people People like to throw a few more mics up, like maybe a Versed mic, uh, a hi-hat mic, a ride spot. Although I've never personally been a fan of mic in the hi-hat, I think it's safe to say that if you've only got an 8-channel interface, you're going to have to compromise on something. Either you can't mic the toms, or you can't have any room mics, or you're going to have to record in mono, and none of those options are particularly optimal. If your existing audio interface has an ADAT expansion port, you can just grab another rack of 8 mic pre's and connect it up digitally. So what options are there on the market currently? We've got the Behringer ADA 8200. You've got the Focusrite Octopre. Is that good? Yes, it's all right. And then when you go up in price, there's essentially nothing serious in between the Focusrite Octopre and the stuff which is like two grand and that kind of price range, except for the audience stuff. And they've got two options, the ASP 800 and the ASP 880. And the 880 is almost twice the price of the Octopre. So obviously that raises the question, why would I spend more instead of just getting the Focusrite Octopre? Of course, the Octopre does the job, but if I spend more, am I going to get a different sound character? Am I going to get something that sounds more expensive? What if I spend thousands of dollars? Is it going to sound really a lot better, like something from Neve, for example? Is it going to sound amazing compared to the Octopre? Well, in my personal experience, all preamps sound pretty much identical when using them in their operating range with condensed mics. When you start driving a mic pre, that's when the distortion characteristics come out and then you can start hearing differences between mic pre's. But in my personal opinion, it's better to record clean and then apply a distortion in the mix because you might record it too distorted and then regret it and you've got more flexibility if you do that just putting the distortion in the mix. So if you agree with that approach, then all mic pre's that aren't broken sound pretty much identical when using condenser microphones. The differences reveal themselves more when using dynamic microphones because the Although the mic pre's themselves don't sound different, when using different dynamic microphones with different impedances, then that can load a dynamic microphone differently and then change the tonality of the microphone itself. And exactly that is one of the most interesting features about the Audion ASP880. It's got variable impedance on every single channel. Now that's a feature that the Focusrite Octopre does not have, and this is one of the only remaining features which I'm actually interested in accessing on a piece of hardware, since the polarity inversion and the high pass filters and stuff like that is all trivially easy to do in the mix digitally. Whereas impedance, if it does actually have an audible effect on the sound, that's not something that you're really going to be able to affect in the mix unless you just try and mimic it with EQ but the actual effect of how it's loading the dynamic microphone differently that should be dialed in whilst doing the recording on the mic pre itself so if it actually makes a difference in the sound quality then this would be a massive argument to spend a bit more money and get the ASP 880 from Audion as opposed to the Octopre from Focusrite especially considering that the next contender on the market for eight channels with variable impedance on each channel would be the SSL Pure Drive Octo and that's around twice the price of the ASP 880 and what I said previously about Focusrite not having variable impedance only applies to the Octopre because Focusrite does in fact have variable impedance on every single channel and that's available in their Focusrite ISA 828. But that thing costs a lot of money and so there's pretty much not that much on the market which has eight channels variable impedance apart from the ASP 880 unless you want to spend a whole bunch of money. So if variable impedance does make a difference, and that is a difference that you like the sound of and you're interested in, well, the ASP 880 might be an interesting contender because everything else costs way more, unless you want to DIY your own mic pre, and that's also an option.
So of course the proof is in the pudding and the only thing left to do is to take a listen. And as you've come to expect on my channel, that's exactly what we're going to do in today's video. And thankfully, Audient were kind enough to send over the ASP 880 so we can put this through its paces to test it out and hear exactly what it sounds like. And the best instrument to record is, of course, drums. So we can really hear what it's doing to the transients, what it's doing to the tonality of the microphones. And of course, like I already said, variable impedance works best on dynamic microphones. That's because condenser microphones kind of buffer the impedance. And if you want to hear this thing in action, comparing the different impedance settings with dynamic microphones recording drums, we're going to need some dynamic microphones to record drums. So Aventone were kind enough to send out a demo loan unit of the uh, mic kit that they've got, the CDMK drum microphone kit. It comes in this big retro looking case and inside we have as a kick drum microphone, a snare mic, and a couple of tom mics, and also a pair of condenser microphones for the overheads. So that's what we're going to be using in today's video, the Aventone drum mics and the Audion ASP 880, and we're going to hear how that combination sounds. So this is a setup before I put the microphones up. It's a cheap kick drum and a cheap floor tom, but I brought my own snare, which is pretty nice, and my own cymbals, which are masterworks, and they're pretty nice. So we're gonna see what kind of result we can get. So how am I recording it? I'm recording it with the Audion ASP 880, and here we have selectable impedance. So we're gonna try that out. I've got the Focusrite Claret Plus 8 Pre, which I'm going to be using as the audio interface. And the Focusrite, we've already talked about, it's a great interface for the money. Audio and also make decent interfaces for the money. I've recommended them before. They have uh, a similar one. They're almost the, the same, but this is the expander. So we're going to listen to how that sounds today. Now, for our first AB of the high and low impedance, let's listen to the snare mic, the batter side. Just a quick note that on this unit, there are three impedance settings, higher, medium, and low. We are only listening to higher and low so we can hear the biggest differences. Let's now listen to the snare drum on the wire side. In my personal opinion, this is an incredibly important microphone to capture for certain genres of rock. For example, the later Oasis stuff really used the wire side a lot, but you can overdo it and make it sound like you're hitting a biscuit tin. Some genres of rock, for example, progressive metal, for example, Isis, or a band like that, they wouldn't use this microphone at all and or hardly at all. And so it really depends on what you're doing, but this can be a really important mic. Now, although I brought my pretty nice sounding birch ply snare with a fresh coated emperor on there, the kick drum and the floor tom that I was using was the drums that were just hanging out at this place that I was recording at, and they're absolutely horrendous. I tried my best to tune them, but at some point, you've just got to remember the phrase garbage in, garbage out. And still, we can still take a listen to the floor tom and see on the close mic if there is a difference to be found there in the impedance. It doesn't sound amazing, but this is probably going to highlight if there's any differences in the impedance switches, especially in the low, mids and bass frequencies. And now finally, I'm saving the worst till last, and that's the kick drum. Everything about this kick drum that I found there is completely horrendous. It, for a start, it didn't have a hole in the resonant 
skin. And that's not a problem if you've got like a 24 or 26 inch kick with amazing skins because you can get a really nice mid-frequency smack off of the resonant head and it can sound fantastic, especially if you have two microphones, one further back to catch more of the bass and one uh, further up to get more of the transient sounds of the kick. That can sound amazing. But this one is just a terrible sounding 22 inch kick with worn out stock heads. And despite my best efforts to tune it, it sounds like someone throwing a loaf of bread on a trampoline. So the spring in the pedal also was worn out, causing the worst beta bounce that I've ever experienced. And the result is the worst kick drum sound that I've ever <laughs> recorded. And because I couldn't get a microphone inside the kick, I mic'd the batter head of the kick drum as well. And that's what this sounds like. So both sides of the kick drum sound so bad that they're just objectively unusable. But before we hit the delete button, let's see if we can do any tricks to salvage it. So the batter head sounds so awful. I think we can go ahead and just completely delete that from the session. Whereas the resonant head, although it sounds horrendous as well, I think it's salvageable. And I've got some plugins here, which I've just experimentally made a vastly improved sound. And I'm going to go through that right now. It's not perfect, but it's vastly improved. So if we just start off and listen to what impedance setting we prefer, you can hear that the high impedance, it's got more bass and stuff like that. But we don't really need more bass. What I'm really looking for is punch and this sounds a bit more punchy. So I'm going to go for this low impedance version. And now the first plugin that I've got here is curvature. And you see the triangle. That's because I'm listening to the delta. In Reaper, if you hold down Alt or Option and you click on the wet and dry knob, then you listen just to the delta. If you don't have that in your DAW, and most DAWs don't, well then you're gonna have to do some kind of phase reversal stuff. But don't worry because I'm gonna integrate a gate algorithm into curvature at some point anyway. But for now, it's really easy to just hit the delta uh, button here in Reaper, if you use Reaper. So what am I doing with that? Well, I play it first off and then put it on. So it's really aggressively gating the sound to get rid of a lot of that other background stuff going on and the bleed. We're not completely killing the signal to like minus infinity. We're just really uh, taking down a lot of the rest of the sounds in a really brutal way and exposing the slap of the kick for later processing. That's not the finished sound at all. Now we can get another instance up of curvature and then shape that gated sound so it's more emphasizing the attack. So we can listen to the result of that now as well. So really heavy compression there. And it's really emphasizing the attack, the slap, the transient of the kick. And now with the third instance of curvature, because we've got such a tight, gated punchy sound on the kick now we don't really have a lot of body so i've used this instance of curvature to give it way more body so i'm using just a tiny bit of feedback here to feed back and give more bass with a bit of emphasis towards the bass here and we can see uh, it's changing the level a bit so it's not perfectly volume match but you can hear that it's giving way more body And now we can AB the raw recording with what I've just done and see what you think. So as you can hear, it's not taking it from the worst sounding kick drum to the best sounding kick drum, but it's definitely violated the expression you can't polish a turd because we took a turd and we have now polished it and it's looking significantly better than it previously did. And now lastly, I've got an EQ instance here where I'm taking out some weird resonances in the upper bass and dialing in a huge amount of sub bass there so we can get a bit more of a weighty sound without it sounding like a Tupperware box. And 
Let's listen to how that sounds. Sounding a lot better in my opinion. So we can A, B that. Pretty night and day difference. Again, it's not making it sound like the best recording in the world, but we're saving something that was ready to be deleted. Let's have a listen to how that is sounding with the overheads and then we'll call it a day for this video and in the next video we will uh, maybe turn this into a full track and see how it, this drum recording holds up when it's got guitars, bass and vocals on it. And maybe we can do some fun things recording vocals as well. Now, if you enjoyed this video on drum recording, you're in luck because I've got more drum recording content coming very soon.